Good morning, good morning. It is so good to be together. It is so good to be in this nice, warm sanctuary. You know, last Wednesday, somebody opened their mouth about snow. Hmm. I don't know who that was. Might have been me, Danny. I don't know. <laughs> Oh, mercy. But it is good to be together. My name is Daniel, and I'm the pastor here at the McCordsville United Methodist Church. I want to welcome those that are gathered here in person and those that are gathering also online to our 930 hour worship. Our hope and our prayer is that the good Lord would meet us upon the step of life that we are on. And in that meeting, in that meeting, we'd experience the depths of his love and the vastness of his grace. Amen. 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 That through every song that is sung, through every word that is spoken, that we would feel the Lord's presence. Hmm. Well, I do have some important tidbits to share with you, some important things to share with you. Chosen Nights will resume, yes, this evening. We'll resume this evening, and it will be at 6 o'clock. We'll be out of here no later than 7.30. Uh, it's really been a, a great journey of the five episodes that we've watched together and discussed together. Um, I invite you to, uh, to come, even if you haven't been to any of them, and, uh, and just join in in the conversation. Um, you can watch The Chosen to get caught up if you want on multiple streaming devices, and uh, Chosen even has their own app. So, But tonight, 6 o'clock, we will be continuing the conversation. We have three more evenings together. The Ad Council is going to be meeting tomorrow night at 7 o'clock. If you're a chair of one of the committees, please make note of that. Also, this Thursday will be our next blood drive, and I believe that is from 2 to 7 o'clock, and there, are, is there is still availability for that. Echoing last week, uh, the missions team has taken on the project to help support Life Choices Care Center over in Greenfield. Uh, I found their mission statement to be really uh, just, uh, just awesome, and George is going to be passing out some of these uh, brochures, but, uh, but you might be curious who Life Choices is, but their mission is, no matter who you are or what your story is, our doors are open and our services are always free. We provide information on all your options as an incoming mother. You're not alone. We are here to help. Uh, so if you, uh, you'll see these baby bottles down at the, uh, around the round table. I actually think they might have their own table now somewhere down in that area. So uh, as you're going, please grab some of those bottles. Fill them up with change. You can put a check in. There's a receipt a note in there for, for tax purposes as well. But you can also give online uh, through their website. So there's a number of ways for, uh, for you to be able to support them. But they're helping um, young moms, young families, uh, uh, moms in need, and, and it is really a, a, a awesome, awesome nonprofit. So please take a moment and, 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 and check that out. I believe. Oh, wow. Oh, no, just, just kidding. Yep, one more. Thank you, Carolyn. And I'm going to echo that. 845 prayer team meets in the adult Sunday school room, which is the last room down this hallway on the left before you get to the exit of the building. Um, yeah, every Sunday uh, they, they join together, pray together. And uh, a lot of times, even little man Luke joins them. So, uh, uh, yeah, young and old, everybody's welcome. Everybody's invited to come. So 845 before church on Sundays. And with that, let's stand for our call to worship. Majesty. Let's sing it out this morning about his majesty. Here we go. Majesty. Worship his majesty. is at the brace 
somebody's hand or give them a fist bump. Let them know you're glad they're here. Father, we just come before you here today, just so thankful, just so grateful that you have led us to be here, a part of this time together with your body. We pray that through everything that unfolds, that you would do a work of grace within our hearts, within our minds, within our lives. God, if we walk through these doors with heavy burdens, we pray that as we're worshiping you, that as we're hearing your word, that we that we would shed that burden and take your yoke upon us instead. Father, today we just pray that you would be glorified in song and word through this time together. It's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. Let's continue singing. Taking our hymn books to hymn number 62, All Creatures of Our God and King. We're going to sing the first, the fifth, and the seventh. <laughs> You might want those hymn books. <laughs> you can read them. <clears throat> All creatures of our God and King, lift up your voice and with us sing. please join me in the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, 
suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You know what, this week I had a real hard time figuring out what I was going to talk about. I mean, I read and I read and I read and nothing jumped out at me. But last night we were eating pizza at home. Pretty good stuff, isn't it? And all of a sudden in my head it said, pizza. And I thought, how can I come up with a story with pizza? Well, I figured it out. The crust, the white crust, that's God, our foundation. It, the crust is the foundation of the pizza, please, boys. The crust is the foundation of the pizza, and God is our foundation. What do you think the sauce is, the tomato sauce? That represents the blood that Jesus shed for us on the cross. Right, okay? What do you think the peppers and the onions and the mushrooms and the sausage and all that is? What do you think that could be? You think that could be the blessings that God bestows on us? I like my pizza loaded. <laughs> so I want a lot of blessings. The cheese, what do you think the cheese is? The cheese on top of the pizza is God's love that holds us all to, holds everything all together. What do you think? Does it make you want more pizza? Okay. I thought that was a pretty good analogy. And when something hits me in the face like that, I better do it, you know. Sort of like when your mom and dad says, I want that done now. You do it, don't you? Yep. Well, when God tells me this is what I want, I do it. Mm -hmm. Yes. So the next time you eat pizza, I want you to think about that. The crust is God our foundation. The sauce is the blood that Jesus shed for us, represents the blood that Jesus sheds for us. The sausage, the pepperoni, the peppers, the onions, the mushrooms, the olives, that is all of God's blessings. And the cheese holds us all together. That's God's love. Okay? I think we might look at pizza a whole different way, won't we? Let's bow our heads. Lord, we thank you for these children, and we thank you for pizza, whoever discovered it. Let us stop and think when we eat pizza what it can represent. Watch over us. And lead us and guide us and keep us safe and help us to do thy will. 
and keep these children safe and bring them back to us, for we love them dearly, and they are our future. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thanks, kids. Well done, well done, well done. I, I love the analogy of the pizza and our faith. Uh, the only thing, Carolyn, that I might have to counter you on, yeah, the blessings, you got to leave off the mushrooms. I, I just, oh. oh. Sarah, she loves those things. That's all I got to say about mushrooms. Mercy, sex, fungus, oh my. Lens. Anyhow, joys, 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 joys. Do we have any joys that we'd like to share with one another? Yeah, they're in the back. That's awesome. So your son that works out with the, what was the name of the designer again? Paul Smith. Paul Smith, top seller for the last four years out in Cali. That is awesome. Awesome. Yesterday we had a little birthday party for Luke. His birthday isn't technically until uh, Tuesday, um, but, uh, but he pretty much just thinks he's four now. Uh, and it's hard to describe, explain that to a toddler. Like, well, this is your birthday, but your birthday's like three days from... It, moot point but but anyhow while we were opening presents i've never seen a kid do this he, he's opening these gifts and then he's got you know five still in front of him and he just looks up and he says i'm done now and we're like okay all right then yeah that's how we're gonna do this yeah so he opened a gift that he really wanted to play with and yeah rest was history so funny stuff funny stuff any other joys yeah Oh, yeah. Happy anniversary, Marge. That's awesome. 63 years. Yeah. <laughs> thank you, Tosh, for delivering the newspaper. <laughs> That's awesome. Any other joys? Any other good news we'd like to share? Yeah. Yes. 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 Yeah, I was thinking about Larry this morning, actually, and uh, just wondering how he and the family was doing. And, and I, I know that Tim and uh, Gary have been going up and being with him as much as possible. But, but yeah, Tim Cooper's dad, Larry, is in hospice care and uh, wasn't given real long um, um, to be with us. But uh, he, is defeat he is defying the odds, and uh, he, uh, he is still with us. But we definitely need to be in prayer for the Cooper family. Definitely be in prayer for them. Any others? Any others? Yeah, they're in the back. I'm going to choose to see this as a joy, I guess. Uh, <laughs> so I had an MRI on my uh, uh, back and legs on Thursday. And, uh, they seem to know what could be uh, causing the pain. So, uh, like I said, I'm choosing to see that as a joy. <laughs> Amen. Yeah, sometimes getting a answer can truly be a blessing. Definitely, definitely. So, but also continue prayers for you and and the the pain that that you have been experiencing. I saw another hand. I saw another hand. Yes, yes. After Carolyn's analogy of pizza, maybe Riker will start eating pizza with us. <laughs> kids are so funny. Like ours, sometimes that's the only thing they'll eat, and then there's kids that won't even touch it, and it's a beautiful thing. I, I love pizza, but yeah. Hopefully Riker will start eating pizza now. This represents God's love for you. Yeah. Eat it. <laughs> I love it. Yes. I just want to thank everyone for prayers. Um, my daughter did have a healthy baby boy a couple weeks ago, Elias David Kierberger. And that was two days after my mom's passing. So we had a lot going on, but thank you for the prayers and well wishes. Absolutely. And continue prayers with you in this time of grief and uh, as as we 
yeah, as they say, finding that new normal. And now there's a, a grandbaby in the midst of that. And so it is, uh, it's amazing how life sometimes works or someone passes and then a baby's born and uh, that life cycle continues on. And but congratulations on Eliza. What was the name of the boy? Elias. Elias, Elias. And uh, uh, congratulations, but also prayers for you and your family. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. I've got a text from Eric and, uh, this morning. Uh, Eric uh, Schaefer. Schaefer. Uh, Stephanie's grandfather, they put him on hospice. And so uh, they went down to Congressman this morning to speak to spend some time with him. Absolutely. So prayers for the Schaefer family with uh, Stephanie's uh, grandfather is in hospice. So definitely prayers for them. Definitely. Yes. Madeline Ramsey, and that is the lady from Tuxedo Park. She took a tumble. It was in the church email, um, and she's a, a central cog of everything that happens there in the mission of Tuxedo in the heart of that church. And uh, she took a tumble and broke both of her ankles and had surgery on one, um, is home, is uh, recovering, but, uh, but definitely prayers for, for Madeline, definitely. Yes. A co-worker of mine, Emily Wilson. Emily Wilson, okay. Uh, she lost her grandma, so Emily and her family. Prayers for the Wilson family and the passing of Emily's grandma. Yes. Definitely. All right. Let's turn to our Lord in prayer. Let's pray together. Oh, Jesus, today I'm just reminded of the story of Lazarus where you went and were with a family in a fresh time of grief hearing the number of people that are in hospice, the number of loved ones that have passed uh, and, and this last week and the months prior, in the year prior. And we just pray that you, by your presence, would bring comfort to these families. We pray that that word that you spoke to Martha, that even that those who believe in you, even though they die, yet shall they live, we pray that the truth of that verse, the truth of that word, that it would ring ever so true and ever so clear within the lives of these families. Father, we pray and ask that you, by your Holy Spirit, would help families uh, to find that new normal, to help families even have, at times, those hard conversations that need to take place. And, and God, that as families are trying to navigate this thing is called life, that, that your love and your comfort would be with them right at their core. Father, today we're just so elated with a new grandbaby being brought into a family in, in a time of grief. And God, we're just so thankful for those times of joy, those beams of joy, those sunbeams of joy that, God, that you only you could work. Father, today we pray for our congregation and we pray that, God, that all the missions, all the ministries that we commit to, that, Lord, that your blessing would be upon them. We pray that every bag of food that the food pantry uh, gives to someone within this community is a token of your unconditional love and that they would experience your love through every single meal that they cook from that bag of food. We pray, God, that through our relationships that you would cause us uh, just to be ever so bold to begin to invite, invite to the church, invite to the faith, invite to be a part of our lives as we follow you, Jesus. And now, church, I invite you to pray with me the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Beautiful song, beautiful, beautiful, beautiful song. I think my wife leaned over and said that to me two or three times during that song. It's just, uh, just really beautiful. And well done, well done. Well, today's message is entitled Out with the Old and In with the New, and it really doesn't have anything to do with the scripture verses that I sent Debbie. Uh, so, uh, things changed a little bit there, Debbie. Uh, we're actually going to be looking at Mark chapter 1, verses 40 uh, through 44, so uh, that's where we're going to really uh, land. But out with the old and in with the new. You know, every generation seems to have at least one forward thinker, someone to move the needle of society a bit further in innovation, seemingly giving us as people better tools, better gadgets, better cars, better planes, better tech to enhance hopefully, our quality of life. So like one Steve Jobs, I don't think there's a person alive that has not heard of him, or at least his baby, the company that he brought into the modern era, Apple. An innovator that he even stood on the shoulders of in his creation of the iPhone and the iMac, and now his company is standing on his innovations with the Apple Vision Pro, which you can buy for $3,499 is that of one Thomas Edison from the National Archives. On January 27th, 1880, Thomas Edison received the historic patent embodying the principle of an incandescent lamp that paved the way for the universal domestic use of electric light. Oh, the, the office granted Mr. Edison a patent for his electric lamp. Edison's patent was an improvement on electric lamps, not the invention of them. But because of Edison's design changes and the materials he used, such as a carbon filament, his patent allowed for an electric lamp that was reliable, safe, and practical. Edison propelled the United States out of the gaslight era into the electric age. From the time he was a boy, they say he was mesmerized by the mechanics of the universe and with virtually no formal education, I found that interesting, no formal education brought forth innovations that continue to dominate our lives here today. Some, some over a thousand patents. But three of his most famous inventions was the phonograph, practical incandescent light bulb, notice the one in his hand, and the moving picture camera mm, dazzled the public and revolutionized the way people live throughout the world. Out with the old, no more candles to light a room, and in with the new. The light bulb that Edison was improving on was created by one Sir Joseph Wilson Swan. The bulb he created lasted a mere 13 and a half hours. Edison's bulb initially bumped this light in the dark from 13 and a half to 40 hours. And then through changing the filament within the shape of a horseshoe, his bulbs began to burn for a hundred hours. And then through further improvement on Edison's original bulb, we have ourselves the incandescent light bulb that burns, as you may know, for around a thousand to fifteen hundred hours. This may all seem kind of trivial to us because we live, always live with this uh, part of our lives. But the light bulb has been called the most important invention since man made fire. Why? The light bulb helped establish social order after sundown. It extended the work day well into the night and has allowed us to navigate and travel safely in the dark. Out with the old and in with the new. Not only did we get basketball and football and baseball from folks from the 1800s, and thank you for pointing that out, Tosh, we got light bulbs. <laughs> we today literally are standing upon folks from the 1800s' creativity and achievements in more ways than we probably ever have fathomed. Well, enter into this conversation my beautiful and lovely wife, Sarah. 1,500 hours for her with a light bulb was just not long enough. I still remember the day that my wife discovered LED light bulbs. They may cost $50, but those bad boys, says right on the box, right on the box, that they can burn for up to 14 years. Depending on the brand, you're talking 50 to 100,000 hours of light. 
And to think that folks had at one time rely on candles. Ten hours a day is where you get that 14 years. And she came home with that first box of those 50 then bulbs. I about like old Sanford. I about had the big one. I thought, not Elizabeth, I'm coming home. But I thought, I'm coming home, Lord. I'm coming home. But you know what? We don't have to change bulbs in the parsonage much. Oh, those original bulbs, they still be burning. There are just times in life and it's time to hang up the old and bring in the new. We as people don't like change. Yeah, this is a proven reality amongst us as humans. Change goes against the grain of what we like and the normalcy of our routines in life. But there are times when it just makes sense to move on to better and (laughs) brighter things. It wouldn't make any sense at all for us to revert back to the days before the light bulb, would it? Would you like to go back to the only source of light in your home being candles? Maybe a fire in a fireplace? Be comforting and fun for an evening. Hmm. But to live life without the grid? To live life without electricity? Could you imagine what it would be like if we attempted to revert back? Some are sitting there going, please, please. (laughs) Now, there are times that we must go the route of out with the old and in with the new. From horses to automobiles. From phones attached to walls with 20-foot cords. (laughs) We all had one. Phones that fit in our pockets. From computers the size of a room to do simple functions like a calculator to computers the size of calculators. From a world riddled with sin and sickness to a world by Christ put to rights. Which brings us to our main passage this morning. Mark chapter 1. Verses 40 to 44. I invite you to stand with me for this reading of God's word. And a leper came to Jesus, imploring him, and kneeling, said to him, If you will, Lord, you can make me clean. Moved with pity, he stretched out his hand, and he touched him, and said to him, I will be clean. And immediately the leprosy left him, and he was made clean. And Jesus sternly charged him and sent him away at once and said to him, see that you say nothing to no one, but go and show yourself to the priest and offer for your cleansing what Moses commanded for a proof to them. Let's pray together. Lord, in this continued time of preaching and teaching, we pray that you, Holy Spirit, would bring the inspiration We pray you that inspired the writing of the word would inspire the hearing and preaching of the word here today. And all God's people said, amen. Amen. May be seated. From light bulbs to leprosy? Leprosy isn't something that is really common here in the States at all. There's reported only about 200 cases a year here in America. And most of those cases, not all those cases, occur because someone came in contact with someone with leprosy abroad in a country where it's much more common. Leprosy was and is a nasty disease. It's as the folks uh, with The Chosen put it. He said, in ancient times, leprosy was a vicious condition with no known cure. It deformed its victims by causing lumps as well as scale-like wounds to grow on the body and could even lead to the complete degeneration of skin and the twisting of bones. Fingers and toes and ears and noses sometimes rotted away, making it difficult for people to breathe and likely for them to go blind. Doing the daily work required to survive well, became nearly impossible. Being such, it was one of the, if not the, most feared diseases in ancient times. People were absolutely terrified of those with and of leprosy. 
For one interaction with someone infected meant that they themselves could too become infected. It was known to be extremely contagious, extremely contagious. Leprosy could quite literally wipe out an entire family, entire neighborhood, if not contained. Families could be decimated by a single infection. You know, this makes me think of how it was at the height of COVID. If anyone had even the slightest of sniffles, folks would run. I distinctly remember seeing someone cough once at Meyer, and folks scurried away from that person quicker than cockroaches from light. There was a palpable fear, though, in grocery stores and shops, uh, places of businesses back then. And if someone were to say, that's just my allergies, well, we'd all say inside, sure it is, yeah. We've all heard that just my allergies thing. <laughs> oh, yeah. Now the fever three days later. Hmm. Well, remember that fear. That fear well, was similar, less than, but similar to how folks felt about this leprosy. Being such, folks in the first century put things in play to protect the healthy from those with leprosy. The folks at the chosen continue. It says those suspected of contracting the disease had to show themselves to the priest, who would evaluate their condition and diagnose them as clean or unclean. And unclean meant you were as good as dead and banished from the city to keep the disease from spreading. Could you imagine what it would have felt like to be a person with leprosy? Could you imagine the fear that would grip your heart as soon as you saw a small bump or scaly blemish show up on your skin? Could you imagine going to the priest and hearing the words that you are unclean? Hmm. There's more. Lepers were forced to live in tents or caves in designated colonies. Forced to wear bells to alert people to their presence. And they were required to yell, unclean, unclean, should anyone accidentally come within the legal range. Having been ripped from their homes and families and friends and all other comforts in life, their only hope for relief was death. Huh. Huh. Which is where the phrase comes, treat them like a leper, or treat them like they have leprosy. These people were abandoned, ostracized, shunned, rejected, banished, exiled, expelled, excommunicated, kicked out from the community. Forced to live as worse than homeless, for they couldn't even panhandle for money. Live the rest of their days in a cave with a fellow sick. This is a surefire case, I would argue, of needing some out with the old and in with the new. And light bulbs, well, they wouldn't do. Only Jesus could be of a help in a situation like that. And as the passage reveals, our passage this morning reveals, not only could Jesus be of a help, he could heal leprosy in its entirety. Everyone knew somebody, a family friend or a friend of a friend or a town acquaintance that contracted this deadly disease and was cut off until death from the rest of society. Hearing that someone was able to not just treat, but to miraculously heal leprosy, well, that... That was the news of all the news of the day. And arguably one of the reasons that Jesus became so popular in his ministry. He was even able to heal, they would say, people with leprosy. Be akin to discovering insulin, or penicillin, and vaccine for smallpox. The news of Jesus would have been hot off the press. Someone is able to heal the worst disease of all, of leprosy. Now, Mark's version of this healing has a very, 
very, very, very interesting little inclusion. A lot of times these gospel writers and New Testament writers, they, they'll, they'll, they'll toss in a word that just is full, full of meaning. Well, Mark did such a thing. In the English standard, though, it translates this word that I'm pointing at as moved with pity. Yeah. Sometimes translators like to take a softer or more comfortable approach to translating of hard words, uh, of words that have a good deal of emotion around them. It's like they try sometimes to soften the blow. I like it when translators just give it to you raw, just raw. The NIV of all the translations that I peeked at, well, they got closest to this original Greek word of apokonteo, and this was from Mark chapter 1, verse 41, and they translated that fancy little Greek word as indignant. That's a different meaning. Move with pity, but Jesus was indignant? Hmm. We don't always like when words like this get attributed to Christ. That takes him out of the fluffy unicorn you know, idea of Jesus to someone much more bold. He was indignant. That's what the word says when this man approached with leprosy. It, Jesus' response to leprosy is reminiscent of his response to death even, which I found interesting. Specifically, Jesus' response to Lazarus' death, where he bellowed. You know, he didn't just say, Lazarus, please come out. He, he bellowed like, Lazarus, come out. Ugh, a lot more emotion and passion was in that. And the word here indicates that he was well, not happy and was angry even. Like, not a little peeved, you know, or a little bit upset because somebody cut you off on 465 or that the Detroit Lions weren't in the Super Bowl to beat the Chiefs. You know, probably even angrier than that is really what the word was really getting at. So my daughter tells me that she can tell when I'm really angry because I get this particular look in my eye, you know. I would call it the Griswold look, you know, when he gets over the tipping scale and there's just this look, and, and she says when, when, when this look hits my eyes, she knows I'm done. <laughs> it's, just, it's over for a minute, yeah. Well, I don't know if Jesus, you know, he got that same sort of look or not, but, but it was obvious to the people around him that he was physically, emotionally angry, that he was angry, and it may, probably made people a little bit uncomfortable, like, what, what is this? So then the question comes, well, what was he angry about? Well, why was Jesus angry? Well, why? Like, what? Was he angry that the leper approached him? Because they're not supposed to do that. You know, was he angry that this leper in his approaching didn't start crying out the top of his lungs like he was supposed to, that I'm unclean, I'm unclean? No. As one biblical scholar put it, it's believed that the indignation of Jesus was that the distortion of God's creation or the forces of evil. Jesus' anger is a righteous anger. We don't always hit that right, us. You know, be like, my anger is righteous. Yeah, no, probably not, you know. <laughs> but Jesus could do it, though. <laughs> There's a righteous anger that recognizes the work of the evil one and the sick and as well as the oppressed. Just as Jesus bellowed with rage at the death at Lazarus' tomb because he did not like death, <laughs> does not like death. So Jesus here shook with anger at how sickness had crept into creation and had quite consumed this man. A deep, different form of compassion is shown in Jesus here. Christ was moved with love for this withered man. And when he saw what the leprosy had done to him, anger bubbled out of that compassion. He wasn't angry at the man. He was angry at the existence of sickness, especially here at leprosy. Leprosy caused great harm to people whom he and his father loved. 
Leprosy tore away at the flesh and hope of cherished people. It caused people to live out the rest of their days alone and afraid. And Jesus did not like it one bit. He was indignant about it. You know, Dylan Thomas, I believe, nailed this uh, motion well um, that I believe that was stirring within Jesus at both Lazarus' death and cured the man with leprosy. I'm sure you've heard this. It says, you know, do not go gentle into that good night. Old age should burn and rave at close of day. It says, rage, rage against the dying of the light. Make this even more personal. I'll never forget the day that I sat in the doctor's office with my dad and my mom when they told us that my dad's cancer was treatable but not curable. They told us that he, without treatment, had maybe six months to live. And with treatment, he could possibly live for up to two years. You know, my insides like were shredded that day in that office. You know, I hurt. I ached. And after the appointment, you know, I held it together when my parents were in that room. But after the appointment, I went out and I sat in my car and I just cried. I mean, for I don't even know how long. Just cried and cried and cried. I was very much indignant towards not my dad, not the doctor, but the cancer. My anger burned and then it broke and turned to grief and sadness. Has anyone ever felt like that before? Be honest, anyone ever felt like that? Yeah. Yeah. That's what it was like for folks to contract leprosy in the days of Jesus. It wasn't an oncologist that would give them this terminal news, though, as a priest. And friends and family, they would have been shattered within in hearing the news. But this is the part that really gets me, and it just causes my heart to swell with love for Christ for it. What the Word is getting at here in Mark was telling us that Jesus, our Lord and Savior, feels the same way about it that we do. You don't always think about the compassion side of Christ coming out in an empathetic way towards his disposition, towards something like sickness. But the word here tells us that he feels the exact same way that we do. And I would even extend it further out and say that he feels that way about all forms of sickness, be it cancer or dementia or Alzheimer's or Parkinson's or MS or AIDS. He feels the same about them as the scripture here reveals he felt towards leprosy. For all of these things distort God's wonderful creation and cause great harm to the people with and people around those that have these sicknesses and diseases. You know, we often hone in on the uh, forgiveness of sin side with Jesus' death and subsequent resurrection. You know, that's the part of Jesus' work that we really like to hone in on as Christians, which is good. I mean, that's, that's a powerful, <laughs> that's, like, that's a really staple part of the faith. But what he accomplished did even more than handle sin and death. See, what he accomplished, essentially a promise that all of creation would one day, because of his death and resurrection, that all of creation would one day be put to rights. That, that, that means no more sin, no more death, no more sickness, no more cancer, no more disease, no more leprosy. No more diabetes, no more hunger, no more inequalities, no more injustice, no more snowstorms even, I would add into that list. Hmm. All of creation, because of what Christ accomplished, would one day be put, as N.T. Wright says, would be put to rights. This is the ultimate, out with the old and in with the new. 
We think it's something to stand on the achievement of folks like Thomas Edison, Steve Jobs, you know, these great minds and thinkers. Well, as Christians, we are standing in our day-to-day lives upon the achievement of the one who has defeated not only sin and death, but has, in his death and resurrection, defeated sickness too. That's who our faith connects us to. That's who our faith allows us to follow. People grappled at any opportunity to sit and talk with Steve Jobs when he was alive. Well, we, by faith, have access to someone far greater than him. We often think that these healings in the Gospels were just meant for the people that were made right. And in part, yes, but there's a bigger story. There's another point that Christ was making with the healings. And that is that he had come. To restore creation. To heal that which was broken. Sin to sickness to death. In fact, the same root Greek word that is used for healing is used for salvation. Meaning that this work is all tied together the same. Where sin morally corrupts. Sickness physically corrupts. And Christ came to put a stopper in both. Sometimes we find the stopper plays out in healings in people's lives in the here and now. And other times we find this healing come when a loved one, say like my dad, passes from this life and into the next. Out with the old and in with the new. This sure beats candles to LED lights, honey. (laughs) But in closing, let's return back to the man with leprosy. We've established that as the man approached, Jesus was not indignant at him for doing so. He welcomed the excommunicated man with open arms, which would have been a shocker to all those in attendance. We're talking gasps. You've heard of the parting of the Red Sea? Well, as this man approached with bells tied around his ankles, the people would have parted. (laughs) They wouldn't have wanted to even bump shoulders with this man. And yet, as this man approached Jesus, the word tells us that Jesus stretched out his hand and he did the absolute unthinkable. And he touched the man with leprosy. There would have been mouths gaping, eyes bulging. I mean, there would have been the, just a, just gasps. <gasps> but then what the people would see is something that they had never seen before. They would see that just from a touch of this man's hand to his, that this man was perfectly healed of leprosy. But Jesus, he didn't stop there. Remember the words of Jesus? He told the man to do what? He said, go to the priest and, you know, bring your offering as Moses has commanded. Well, why would Jesus do that? That would have given this man his life back. It's a beautiful thing. This would have allowed him to go back home and be with his family again. No longer would he spend the rest of his days living destitute in a cave. But from one touch of this man, this God, Jesus, he would get to live the rest of his life with those he loved. My friends, as we have dealt so much, and as we can tell in our prayer times with grief and death, I have some very good news. One day, because of Jesus, we like this man that got to go and be with his family and live the rest of his days with them. We, because of this Jesus, we will all one day get to do the same. Out with the old and in with the new. One day, death will be no more. One day sickness will be no more. 
One day, one glorious day, everything will be eternally new. Let's take our hymn books in closing and turn to hymn number 420. Hymn number 420, let's stand as we sing, Breathe on me, breath of God. Jesus, we're just so thankful for this time together. So thankful that we uh, get to serve you, someone that truly understands what it's like to live on this earth, to deal with things like sickness. For you took on this flesh and you lived in this life. You lived here just like us. And so we just pray today that our hearts would swell, would just swell with love and appreciation for you. It's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Like, you ever really just stop and consider what you're saying there because he lived? Oh, is it over 50 years old? 1971. I was made about the same time as the first microchip, so you know. In the words of our good friend, Mr. Jim Turney, be responsible for yourself as you grow with God. Be responsible with yourself as you grow with God. Folks, let's grow with God. And I'll add, and be there for one another. Amen? Amen. Amen. See you next time.